Ignorance is bliss, so thought a young woman who gave birth to a blind son. She didn't want to know, want her son to know that he was blind, and so she told all of the family and neighbors, do not say any telltale words about sight and light and color. And so this boy grows up in his own dark world of blackness. And he's unaware of his disability until one day a strange girl jumps over the back fence and she begins talking about light and sound and color and explodes his world. His world shatters in the face of this new unimaginable reality. Dear friends, Jesus Christ is that otherworldly voice that comes and speaks against all of the untruths of this world. That otherworldly voice. You know, as I look around, as you look around in the world today, never has this country been so divided in such disharmony and division since the American Civil War or even Vietnam. And heaven has sent Jesus Christ to speak the truth. He came to bring peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And any one of us who are concerned about the clearest gospel of it all in the last days, that everlasting gospel message spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, or 14, cannot but help catch that oft-repeated statement that people make. People say as an excuse, well, everybody else is doing it, and it's just believed as a common truth. But if you believe in truth, in the everlasting gospel, in the clarity of Jesus' voice on this earth, that statement will bother you. Because truth means something. Amen. Amen. Faithfulness and honesty, we are told by the world, that is an unattainable unreality. Faithfulness and honesty. That is the widespread philosophy that folks, is the source of all of the corruption that threatens ultimately to ruin of mankind. You know, it was invented and introduced when there was war in heaven. It was fomented by the dragon and his angels because it was Satan who charged that it is impossible to keep the commandments of God, that God's law is precisely what they say, as an unattain unattainable morality. The implication of Satan's rebellion is, of course, that God is unfair to require moral faithfulness since Satan says it is impossible. And today, that dragon it insists concerning marital faithfulness, speaking the truth and lying. He whispers in our ear, everybody else does it. But the Savior who was born in Bethlehem has proved that Satan is telling a lie to us under oath. Amen. Romans chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 sets forth some good news to us regarding the truth. And we desperately need to know it. God sent his son in the likeness of our sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in our flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, moral and marital fidelity, faithfulness, according to this text, is possible. In fact, unfaithfulness, infidelity, and lies are impossible for the one who walks after the Holy Spirit. What does it mean, then, to walk after the Holy Spirit? It means to say no to the temptations of the flesh and to say yes to the Holy Spirit who wants to do that in us. It's just that simple. You know, two of the Ten Commandments speak about how we use our tongue. The third commandment says that if we believe the good news of Jesus Christ, we will never be guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain. And the ninth commandment becomes a wonderful assurance to the one who understands and believes how good the good news is. 
We can't imagine what our Redeemer has in store for us, but the Holy Spirit gives us a few clues. But it is like a person that has been blind from birth, trying to comprehend what color is all about. Say there is this man who is in his 50s and he was born blind. He can't see a thing. His world is full of black halls of sounds and smells. He feels his way through five decades of darkness, of sounds and smells. And then, after 50 years or so, let's say a miracle happens and he can see. Maybe a skilled surgeon has performed a complicated operation and for the first time he has his sight. He finds the world around him overwhelming and he is excited. I never would have dreamed that yellow is so yellow, he exclaims. I don't have the words. I am amazed by yellow. But red, red is my favorite color. I just can't believe red. I can see the shape of the moon and I like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky and seeing the vapor trail it leaves behind. And of course, I love the sunrises and the sunsets. And at night, I look at the stars in the sky and the flashing lights. You could never know how wonderful seeing everything is. Now imagine if you had lived in a world of darkness like that, and then you could suddenly see what was, what was reality. Imagine if you lived in a world without taste and suddenly you could taste a wonderful buffet that was unimaginable. Imagine if you lived in a world without sound and then you could hear beautiful music. Well, that's what Jesus wants to give to us who have lived in untruth all of our lives as it were. This is the wonderful promise of the commandment found in Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's God's promise to us. We will not believe and speak untruths, but we will let that otherworldly voice of Jesus speak the truth to our hearts, and we will believe it. You know, the entire Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, rightly understood, is good news. It is not bad news. And God is not some kind of a dictator or a stern lawgiver who is dishing out a series of impossibles in the Ten Commandments to us today. Rules with the penalty of death just hanging over our heads. But Jesus is our Savior from breaking those truths of the Ten Commandments. Amen. They are ten promises. And He wants to deliver us from death. Because He has purposed that every human being shall enjoy eternal life. We read, For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Christ is already the Savior of the world, and according to 1 Timothy 4, especially those that believe. Now, when God the Father sent His Son to this earth, He gave Him a special job description. Go down to that lost world and save it. So Jesus says, in John 12, verse 47, Jesus understands his job description perfectly. And he says, I came to save the world. That's what he, he understood from his father. And he's not trying to shut up the way to heaven. Rather, he's trying to prepare the way for us to enter into heaven. God chose us before in him, before the foundation of the world, having predestined us by adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. But someone says, isn't there a terrible judgment coming when we shall all come under the stern scrutiny of God's Ten Commandment law? Yes, but we also read, if any man sin, we have 
a defense lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. So if anyone is afraid that this great defense lawyer won't take his case, then John adds, John adds these words, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. As a defense lawyer, Jesus has taken on everyone's case in this whole world. He is already your defense lawyer if you don't push him away. He's already the propitiation for our sins. He shows himself. He shows the Father's love in order to bring our hearts into harmony with he and his Father. You know, there are some criminals who are under trial and halfway through the course of their trial, they will fire their lawyers and consequently lose their cases. So I admonish you, do not fire your lawyer, Jesus. Keep him on your case, will you? Let him hold on to your case. He's reconciling you and he is defending you. Wonderful as it may seem, Jesus is the new head of the human family. He has fired that old Adam, our first head, who has led us into sin and we've all followed in his footsteps. He's fired him, but Jesus has taken the place of our first Adam. Amen. And so you and I have a wonderful birthright that is given to us in Jesus, just like Isaac's son Esau had the birthright, it was already given to him. Now, nobody in heaven or earth could have deprived Esau of that birthright except his own act of disbelieving it. And so when Esau sold it for a mere dinner entree, we read in Genesis 25, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, Paul warns us, don't give in to the subtle temptation to be a fornicator, or a profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now wouldn't it be heartrending to come up in the final judgment as we stand before the great white throne of God and to realize that he actually gave us the gift of eternal life like he gave the birthright to Esau, but we sold it out. We sold it for some of this world's tinsel treasures. To save from that ultimate agony, he is today sending us the message of the pure gospel, which is very good news to our hearts. It is the truth spoken to us who are immersed in untruths all around us. Now, breaking the ninth commandment is a sin for which many people will lose their souls but there is salvation from that sin. When God says, you shall not bear false witness, he means that we are never to tell even a little white lie, never to give a false impression, even by the nod of our heads. It forbids all gossip, including damaging the reputation of another person by keeping still when he or she is being accused if we know something good to say. Now we can bear false witness sim simply by keeping still when it is possible for us to speak up regarding somebody's reputation. And so this ninth commandment gives us an assurance that we have a Savior who will keep us, who will save us from breaking this commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. We are to speak, as Zephaniah says, each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. So all bearing of false witness comes from its true origin. And who would that be? It would be Satan, wouldn't it? He was a murderer from the beginning, said Jesus. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's in the Gospel of John 8, verse 44. The wise man said in the Proverbs, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. The wise man also said, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. And we read that God actually hates a lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. All of this in Proverbs. But remember, even though God hates lying, the Bible assures us that he loves the liar. And he seeks to save him or her from lying. That's the point. There are dear, sincere people who, are, who bear false witness. They don't have any idea what they are doing. They're doing it in all their own sincerity. But they're among those for whom Jesus said when he was dying on his cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And sometimes parents can teach little children to tell lies. But still, God loves them and he wants to enlighten them. And some people are colorblind. That is, they can't tell the difference between a red light and a green light. And what's the result of that? They have accidents. They have accidents because they run the red lights. Now I think of an agnostic, a famous one, whose name was Thomas Huxley. And he was once confronted by a loving Christian, a very sincere Christian. And this believer stressed to Thomas Huxley that he was not in any way impugning Huxley's sincerity. Nevertheless, the Christian said to him, might it not be possible that mentally you, the great scientists, are colorblind? In, that, in other words, some people cannot see traces of green where other people cannot help but see green. Could it be that this was Huxley's problem? That he was simply blind to the truth that was quite evident to others. Huxley, being a man of integrity, admitted that this was possible and he added that if it were possible, that he himself, of course, could not know or recognize it. Now, God is merciful to such people. But better still, God has promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who don't know the difference between right and wrong. God has promised that. And God wants to be their teacher. He wants to be that other voice from the other world to teach them the truth about right and wrong. So we need to listen to him, especially as we're living today in the judgment day. Ignorance of the truth will be no excuse when all the truth is coming out in this day of judgment. And thank God right now we have an opportunity to learn. Thank God we are still going to school. Amen? <laughs> We're in the school of the sanctuary, and Jesus is our master teacher. Now, in the last two chapters of the Bible, we have three warnings, and they tell us, quote, that whoever loves and practices a lie will not be able to enter the eternal kingdom. That's in Revelation 22, verse 15. Now, there are books and there are movies that tell a lie. And they are loved by one whose heart is not reconciled to God. And so we see that not only is it a serious thing to practice a lie, but it is equally serious to love a lie. And long before the lips may utter a falsehood, if the heart is dishonest, 
we have already sinned. Quote, the Lord who may dwell in your holy hill, he who speaks the truth in his heart. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool, says the wise man. In other words, we could smile at someone and slap them on the back and shake their hand and yet hide our hatred of him deep within our heart. We could. All of this is breaking the ninth commandment. We need hearts that are cleansed with the honesty of truth. And so what this really boils down to is it is impossible for any of us mortals to obey the ninth commandment unless we let Jesus convert us deep down to the truth in our hearts. Jealousy of someone else who seems prettier or better than we are, even a desire to see that person fall, all this happens long before any word is spoken. And we all know how that problem is deep within our own hearts. And it's so true, as Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Surely we need to pray. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Search me, O God, wrote David, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me. We don't want what Psalm 140 says, which is deep with inside everybody by nature. We don't want this. It's an interesting thing that Psalm 140 says. The poison of snakes under the lips. We don't want any of us that, do we? Oh, my, do we ever need a Savior from that. And thank God we have a Savior from that. So we understand now that we can bear false witness by saying nice things to people. Yes, if we're speaking flattery, saying something nice to someone's face, and then snickering behind their back, that's bearing false witness. A man, it says in Proverbs 29, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. David tells of the pain that he suffered. He said the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Interesting metaphors, aren't they? So we do not realize how deep the problem is rooted within us. It's so easy to say, Good morning to someone when in our heart we wish he could get what he deserves. The ninth commandment calls for complete honesty in our dealings with one another. But suppose you know someone who is doing wrong. How can you be honest? How can you be pleasant at the same time? Well, sure, you can pray for him. As Jesus prayed for the bad people who crucified him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. It doesn't help to rebuke someone unless the love of Christ is in your heart. Doesn't do anyone any good unless the love of Christ is in your heart to rebuke them. But if that love is there, the Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what you should say to that person. You might be able to help that person. But if not, you can be happy, for your conscience will be clear. So the tongue is this instrument that is often the agent in breaking the ninth commandment. Says Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. <laughs> But he who restrains his lips is wise. That's good advice, isn't it? Good counsel. Be not rash with your mouth, 
And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. Let your words be few. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2. And if we sense how easily we are tempted to be deceptive, we can remember the common sense good news of the Apostle James that will save us a whole lot of messing up of our lives when he wrote, If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And even so, the tongue is a little member. How great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, and it is set on fire by hell. A match, one little match, can do a whole lot of damage, can't it? Both for good, it could do some good, or a whole lot of bad, depending on the will and the heart of the one who is using it. And so this is indeed good news for all of us. The ninth commandment becomes an assurance to us. The one who believes the beginning of the Ten Commandments, that the Lord your God has already delivered you out of your house of bondage, and that includes our deeply learned habitual breaking of the ninth commandment, bearing false witness, God promises to save the tongue because he first of all saves your heart. Christ came down to this world and he took upon us our sinful nature, living as we must live in an evil and corrupt society and yet always saying no to the temptation to tell lies, or even to give anyone a false impression. He met the dragon of sin in its own lair, our fallen human flesh, and conquered it. In very simple terms, it means the same as that beginning of the Ten Commandments. He has delivered us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You and I do not have to go on any longer in our deceptive ways and practices because Jesus has promised to make us honest from the depths of our hearts. From inside out, beginning on the inside and out. What a precious blessing that is that Jesus has promised to you and to me. And so as we look John tells us about such a people at the end times. He says, Behold, I see a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and it has to be a symbol of the overcoming church, and with him 144,000. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And then these words, In their mouth was found no guile. You know what that word means. It means no deceit. No deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to wash that word down the drain and forget about it, do you? That's an important part of the gospel. It, it is written there for you and me to believe that the war, Lord wants to wash our deceitful tongue so that it speaks honesty from the heart outward. This is a people who as a group are different from any others in all of the world history. For they sing, it says, as it were, a new song before the throne. And what that simply means is, did you hear this song that the little one sang up here? It came from her heart, wasn't it? So even though that was a familiar song, it was a new song sung by a young person that you had never heard it sung from before. It came from a new experience, didn't it? And that's what the new song will be of the 144,000 as they sing a new song from a new experience, overcoming through Jesus' grace. And a new experience means that they have 
heard and they have received a new message, a fresh proclamation of the everlasting gospel, which has accomplished this wonderful achievement. Yes, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto eternal life. Now today, as the three angels' messages are being proclaimed throughout the world, it's a promise to you and to me and to the world that we have been delivered out of the bondage of Egypt. The prison doors have been opened. We're no longer in slavery to sin and to the devil. And so we are invited to walk out into the sunshine of truth and color and sight and light. I know that some people are going to say to you, well, lying isn't so bad. And little lies, everybody does it. But the important thing is, when you're put under oath, then you should not lie. That's what people tell us. But Jesus tells us that we should talk as though we are under solemn oath all of the time. Here's what he says in Matthew 5, 37. Let your communication be yes, yes, no, no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of the evil one. <laughs> There's no nuance there, is there? There's no shading of the truth there. It's yes, yes, or no, no. Conventional wisdom says that it's commonly taken for granted that unfaithfulness will almost automatically uh, continue to lie. But God has a higher wisdom and the gospel is much more effective than that. His Holy Spirit is even now all over the world teaching a people of whom it will honestly be said, in their mouth is found no guile, for they are found without fault before the throne of God. Now, folks, don't laugh at that. That's going to be the truth. It's going to be. And such transparent honesty is the fruit of Christ-like love. And it can be realized only as self is crucified with Christ. He denied himself. He could easily have told a little white lie in order to evade the cross. But Jesus didn't tell any lies. He, and he knew that was the pathway to the cross. And I say hallelujah indeed.